and I'm so glad to welcome you to the life and work of Addison Meisner with Renee Sylvan, author and historian, on behalf of the Jewish Federation of South Palm Beach County. A special welcome to the many faces joining us today, and it's a pleasure to see so many familiar faces and names. Our Federation Live virtual programs are among the many ways we have been reaching out to bring our Jewish community together over the past three months. At this same time, our Federation is also working to meet the rising critical needs of our people here in Israel and beyond. Through our annual campaign, our Federation's funding for more than 70 partner agencies enables us to respond immediately in times like these. With our Federation's vital support, our agencies on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis are able to continue, adapt, and increase their care for those most, most vulnerable in the face of these unprecedented challenges. Our Federation is approaching the close of our 2020 annual campaign, and we are still trying to raise the critical dollars necessary to meet the needs of our community. We need to make sure our seniors are safe and continue to live with dignity, to give those with special needs the opportunity to live a life full of joy and hope, even during these times, to ensure that our partners around the world in more than 70 countries can respond to crises like the COVID-19 pandemic. We also say to our brothers and sisters in Israel, we have not forgotten you. You are in our hearts, in our minds, and we will continue to give you our support. Soon, we are going to have to make some difficult decisions if we cannot raise the funds we need to keep our community strong. If you are in a position to help, we ask that you go online today to make a gift to our annual campaign. Every donation of any size makes a difference, and there are so many people counting on us. If everyone on the call would make a donation of $18, just think of how many people we can benefit. After our program, we'll email you some information to learn more about us and how to help, along with additional virtual opportunities to connect. But before we get started, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. Your microphone is muted for the presentation. In addition, you may adjust the way your screen appears. If you would like to view the person who is speaking, please select speaker view at the top of the Zoom screen. If you have questions, you may email them. Now, it is my privilege to introduce our speaker, Renee Sylvan, author and historian. He was born in New York and grew up in Swiss boarding schools. After earning his bachelor's degree from Georgetown University in 1970, and an MBA from Cornell in 1972, he spent 25 years in the investor-owned hospital industry and is the retired CEO of a company which owned and operated hospitals in 10 countries. He has lectured widely on hospital administration and comparative international health care systems. Renee is now a leading authority on the Duchess of Windsor, Addison Meisner, the SS Normandy, Mar-a-Lago in Palm Beach. Renee is listed in Who's Who in the World, as well as Who's Who in Finance and Industry and Who's Who in Healthcare. Please join me in welcoming Renee Sylvan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you also to Marissa and Julianne and all the other, but Eric, I don't want to leave you out, and all the people who have worked so hard on your team to run of this Zoom presentation. Uh, this is the second time uh, in as many months that I have had the honor to speak to you. I deeply regret um, that I can't meet with you and see you. Uh, for those of you who have come to our lectures when they are in big venues, I stand at the door. I like to shake, liked to shake everybody's hands coming in and to welcome them uh, to the meeting. And so allow me to try to do that virtually and to welcome you into our home. Um, and to say that all I hope for this next period is that you can sit back and relax and learn about this man who was incredibly famous and really marked uh, American architecture, but uh, residential architecture, particularly here in South Florida. For somebody who 
was so famous uh, and so well known and so flamboyant. We have very little written about him. Uh, there are no interviews. Uh, there is luckily a memoir, of course, uh, but there's precious little was done for him. And even though the technology was there in the late 20s and 30s to have interviews and films, um, uh, documentaries or pe people following you around, there is nothing about Addison Meisner. So uh, allow me to try to bring this amazing man into your life. The um, best way that I can start to do that, I think the most effective is for to give a, just a few minute background on what Palm Beach was uh, in the period before Addison Meisner came here. Basically, there was nothing. Uh, we'll start in 1878 uh, when the Spanish galleon, the Providencia, came ashore uh, right in front of where Mar-a-Lago now stands in Palm Beach. Uh, it was on its way back to Spain and it was carrying a cargo of 20,000 coconuts. And the very uh, few local people who were here uh, thought, oh my goodness, this is gonna be something that we can all eat. And so they planted them expecting to have a productive food crop, but instead, uh, given the great um, perfect meteorological conditions that we have here, um, a great, uh, within years, they had an island full of palm trees, coconut palm trees, hence the name Palm Beach. Um, we are fortunate here in Palm Beach County and in, and in Dade County and uh, Broward to be on the knuckle of the peninsula that is Palm Beach. Um, it is uh, the easternmost point, and so therefore it also enjoys the best climate because uh, there is, uh, we get some of the Gulf Stream. That also brought shipwrecks to South Florida. But it really remained there, nothing, nothing was in Palm Beach until uh, the advent of uh, Henry Morrison Flagler, um, who in 1894 will extend his pioneering railroad system uh, from uh, the out last outpost having been St. Augustine on down to Palm Beach. This was the, this was the new frontier. It was pioneering. Um, and then he built, uh, when it got to what is West Palm Beach, he built a, a wooden bridge that you can see on your screen carrying a train. That was the only way to get here really, unless you came down on a yacht, which would happen later. Um, and uh, the passengers uh, from New York and Philadelphia uh, would be brought, brought over to the island <clears throat> on this train. Uh, his friend and colleague J.P. Morgan said of, of, of Meisner, um, that um, he had the genius to see what Florida's wilderness of sand and underbrush was capable of becoming, and he had the nerve to build a railroad to get there. And so uh, the next thing that he will do is he will build um, his home here. He's going to set up a quite a home. You can see it there called Whitehall. Um, it's a wonderful museum that can, you can, one can visit. Um, it's in the Beaux-Arts uh, uh, design culture, which is a, a sort of a catch-all term that you'll see later. Um, but he had just married um, his third wife, um, who was nearly 40 years his junior, uh, Mary Lee, Lily Keenan. Um, and uh, he gave her uh, this home um, as a wedding gift. But Addison Meisner later will criticize the home and say that it's just another Southern style mansion, which in fact it is. There was nothing original about its design. It is just another Southern style mansion. Uh, Meisner was quite correct. Um, but uh, people started to visit him. As you can see, a home of this size had a lot of guest rooms and then on, he would bring down some society people from mostly New York and Philadelphia. And pretty soon they wanted a hotel to stay in. And so he built uh, the Royal Ponciana Hotel adjacent to Whitehall, um, which was a stunning hotel. Uh, the, the, one of the most luxurious hotels in America and one of the, ultimately the largest wooden structures in America. But the train would pull right up in front of it. Um, and today, um, if you uh, were to put it, all those wings together, it would be uh, between a third and a, and a half a mile in length. Um, the train came in on, the nor on what's on the higher end of your screen there, that building in the middle of a field, came into there, and they were then the guests were met with all sorts of refreshments and brought across uh, to the hotel. The uh, front door basically was on the back of the hotel, it's what I have outlined there for you um, in blue. Um, and it, it, this is what it was like. As you can see, um, it was a beautiful building and it had absolutely legendary uh, uh, gardens. 
if you came out of the door that you see, um, there was a little launch um, that would take you over to West Palm Beach. Here we are in West Palm Beach, looking back um, at the Royal Ponciano Hotel. And that's what people would do for recreation. There was basically nothing more to do uh, than that, except for one thing that will come on in a little, in a minute. And the only time, the only place that these people could gather were in the two ballrooms, the ballroom at Whitehall, um, if you were privileged enough to be part of that group, um, or the, the large ballroom at the hotel at the Royal Ponciano. There were no grand homes here in which to entertain. There was basically nothing. So I uh, went and took an aerial view uh, to show you, um, and this is from West Palm Beach, looking across at Palm Beach, but to the north. So the, what you're seeing there um, uh, is on the northern, on the far end of the screen, and it's a tiny little bridge. That now is the North Bridge here that uh, brings you into Palm Beach, and it is where the uh, wooden railroad was. And so now I'm going to pan south. Uh, that's the Okeechobee Bridge or the Middle Bridge. That big structure in the back there on the ocean is the Breakers Hotel. And as we come around, uh, that's the Yacht Harbor, the part of uh, Palm Beach known as Intown right there, Worth Avenue being on the southernmost end. Then all of that green area at first is the Everglades Golf Course, and then the, what's known as the estate section or Millionaire's Row down to where Mar-a-Lago sits, which is then Billionaire's Row for the next quarter of a mile. And that would be just sort of at the far end of, of your screen there. So um, let's see, uh, let's talk about who Addison Meisner was. And I'm going to talk about his background um, I'm going to talk about um, the people who influenced him, um, and then we're going to talk about his clients, as well as um, his work in Palm Beach and in Boca Raton, and of course, we have to speak about his death. So, um, as I said at the beginning, there isn't a whole lot written about such a famous man. One of his biographers, Raymond Vickers, said of Meisner, that he was the most flamboyant promoter in paradise, which was true. Uh, another biographer, George Tyndall, um, said that um, he was one of the great uh, 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 charlatan geniuses of the 20s, which is also true. I happen to think and call him a bon vivant. Um, he was also a humanist and an animal lover. He was known to parade around town all of the time um, with Johnny Brown um, on his shoulder. He, that was his spider monkey that you can see on his shoulder um, or, or his birds and his, and, his, and his parrots. But he was mostly known now in residential architectural term as the creator of med rev architectural style. That's Mediterranean revival architectural style. It will come to dominate Palm Beach. It will come to dominate indeed South Florida, and you'll see traces of it all throughout Florida. So someone who was a lot smarter than I uh, said that architecture, like all art, is a work of fiction, but that it has to be believable. Um, and I'm going to show you a typical at Meisner house and a lot of the elements that he will use in all of his different homes. Don't worry, I'll magnify and show pictures. You don't have to strain. I'll, I'll bring it, hopefully bring it to where it's easier to see. But all of these elements in this house in particular, uh, in general, they would be found in all of Meisner's homes. So first of all, um, he focused on cornice details, um, which you will see in all, all, all through his homes. Uh, and then um, he always used arched windows, often with decorative columns in them, such, such as these. And he um, would very often would have balustrated balconies, always would have balustrated balconies, but very often over a front door uh, or the main entry of a building, as you see here. Um, and then he also would have decorative uh, or ornamental or structural um, um, brackets that he used over his roofs, as you can see, uh, on to support his roofs, as you can see here. And so we'll see those details throughout other homes all the time. Um, he had, he preferred rough stucco um, to smooth stucco. Um, and also, finally, he was very famous for having low pitched multiple gables all around his house, houses, as you can see here, for example. 
So I like to uh, talk about all of those elements as if they were ingredients. Um, and sometimes I use the analogy of there could be ingredients maybe in a cake. Uh, so if you put all of the same ingredients on a table um, to make a cake, and you had a famous chef like Wolfgang Puck make a, make a cake, he might come up with something as beautiful as this, uh, Prince William's and Kate's real wedding cake. And if you were an architect and you put all of those ingredients together, you might come up with something like this, um, which is the Kennedy House, uh, La Guerrida here in Palm Beach, which just, by the way, recently resold for $70 million. It is made famous by that area that I've outlined up at the top of the screen, and then it can uh, outline the picture. That's the entranceway. Uh, then you, can, you come through a cloister, which Meisner is famous for, uh, which we'll talk about. And you then entered the house, and that area there um, was made so famous by this iconic picture of the young Kennedy family taken just a few weeks before he died. Now, let's say that you were going to give those same ingredients to bake a cake to a much less competent baker, and we end up giving it to the Swedish chef. If you give it to the Swedish chef, um, he might come up with a cake that looks like that, but it's the same ingredients. And if you gave it to an those ingredients in an architectural sense to an architect, he may come up with a home like this, which is exact all of the ingredients that Addison Meisner so very capably would be able to bring together and create a marvel. I think I had said at the beginning that he had a great sense of humor. He was so charming um, and he had a great sense of humor. Um, he, one of his favorite uh, expressions was where there is a will, there is a lawsuit. Um, and he uh, will team up in New York um, in 1916 uh, as a, already an advent, a middle-aged man who was at that point in time very unhealthy. And he meets a uh, Paris singer. Paris singer um, uh, was the heir to the Singer Sewing Machine Company. He was an enormously wealthy man. Um, and he said of Meisner that Meisner was too large, too talented, too unique to be bound by any straight-laced morality, which is, is true. This was a very unusual fellow um, who you couldn't really fit into any particular box. Frank Lloyd Wright, um, who in my opinion is one of the greatest residential architects of the 20th century and who was not known for giving compliments, said of Meisner that many architects had imagination but only Addison Meisner had the courage to let it out of the cage. So um, here is young Addison, um, who was born um, on December 12 of 1872 in Benicia, California, which by the way was the capital of California at the time. Um, he uh, was part of a large family. He adored his mother, revered her, and was so good to her throughout her later life. And he loved his siblings. This was a very happy young fellow. We see him here at the age of 12. Um, he, uh, as I said, loved both of the parents. You see them here, Lansing um, and, his, and his lovely mother, Ella. And we're going to also introduce um, his brother, his uh, slightly younger brother. We see here, Wilson Meisner at eight years old. And the reason I'm pointing Wilson out is because he will be a very, very important figure in the rest of this story as we unfold it. And uh, not a very good influence on Meisner, uh, but the relationship that they had was extremely close. So uh, a few years after this family portrait was taken, when, when Addison was 12, his father uh, was made um, um, ambassador to Guatemala. And Meisner said that the day they arrived in Guatemala, it was the greatest day of his life. And the reason was that he had started to enjoy architecture, just the study of architecture. Um, and when he got there, he fell in love with 17th century Spanish architecture that Guatemala City is very rich in. Um, and he started to see buildings like that, uh, buildings, churches. Meisner wasn't a very religious man, but he adored churches and he, enjoyed, and he enjoyed very much studying about the architecture and the history of churches and buildings such as this. He loved colonnades and cloisters, which uh, the city of Guatemala City is full of. 
Um, we see here those are uh, uh, colonnades and here's a cloister, typical cloister. And so after a few years, he decided that he would follow his dream of being an architect. Um, and, you'll, and he uh, went to work uh, with Willis, Willis Jefferson Polk in San Francisco in 1894. Polk um, was a, an unusual architect because he, he studied all of the trades. Architects in those days were very, sort of very grand and pedantic and they didn't like to get their hands dirty, but Polk um, was a little different and this will serve Meisner later in years because Polk knew about construction and he knew about construction management and, and um, he knew about all the different trades and Meisner, luckily enough, at his early age when starts uh, being an apprentice with Polk, learns all of these things too. But his early life will be very desperate and very challenged and very different because within a few years he got bored of designing these, uh, what was popular at the time, these California bungalows. He wanted to do more. He also had wanted, he was uh, lured by Wil Wilson, his brother, who wanted him to go to uh, Alaska in the search of gold. Um, and uh, we see that the family all went up there. In fact, they will have a small strike of gold, but Wilson, in typical fashion, will lose it in a gambling party. So after that, they were absolutely penniless, and Meisner leaves to go off à l'aventure to go around the world, and his first stop is in Hawaii, where he may do uh, making what he called horrible charcoal drawings. They're rather sweet, actually, um, and they couldn't have been that horrible because he sold them uh, and he sold enough to go on to Australia uh, where he would become an amateur boxer. In spite of the fact that he had a bad leg, um, he nearly lost it at several times during his life. Uh, he, he had had it crushed early on and there was an infection. And even though he was a very large man and rather strong, um, he will always suffer from this bad leg. Um, he, he, while he's there, he also became a painter. Um, did some very nice paintings, which can't be found anymore, um, as his charcoal drawings are practically also un um, unfindable these days. But after his grand tour, um, he ends up in New York at the beginning of the 20th century, and he befriends the great Sanford White of Mead, uh, uh, and, uh, Mead Fallen and White. And so this was a very prestigious firm in New York, um, and although Meisner didn't work there, uh, he, he really admired this man so much um, that he was at the time, Sanford Wright was at the time, working on some of the cottages in Newport, notably Rosecliff in Newport. And, and he would show Addison uh, the uh, art of designing such grand homes and the detail. Uh, as, and this wonderful was an example, the best example of French Baroque revival. And he would teach Addison a bunch of, of, of sophisticated methods to build these large homes. And Meisner said of him, I worship, worshiped him. For me, he was my God. When Meisner liked someone or wanted something, it was with all of his heart. And he was extreme in his expression as he was um, with the way he felt about Sanford White. So I've mentioned Wilson, and let me bring Wilson back into the story here, because um, Meisner will always take care of Wilson, and Wilson will always be in trouble and will always need taken care of. Um, he uh, was a rather charming person by all accounts. He could charm uh, elderly uh, widowed women, which he did repeatedly, but he'd also charm them out of their money. Um, he was a drug dealer in New York uh, before that was even a common term. Um, and, uh, but Meisner stood by him whenever he got into trouble and he needed bailing out. He was also a playwright of some repute. Um, and he famously said, if you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. But if you steal from many, it's research. So he, he had a great sense of humor also. Um, but uh, as I said, he kept getting into trouble. And shortly after um, uh, Meisner was in Palm Beach, uh, he uh, was beat up very badly, uh, probably in a drug deal gone bad. Um, and Addison said to him, well, all right, come to, come to Palm Beach, Wilson, and we'll take care of you, don't worry. And when Wilson got off the train, um, looked at all of these wealthy women, he said, oh, Florida was invented for Addison Meisner's little brother. 
Their relationship is so unusual that Stephen Stondheim wrote two different plays. They're, they're very, very similar, practically the same, about, about the brothers and their symbiotic and bizarre relationship. And the first one is called Bounce, and the second one is Roadshow. Um, and so uh, there was a period in time where people were very curious about the relationship that these two brothers had, and we'll see how it progresses through, through their lives. Fortunately for us, for Meisner, for the story, the, the uh, challenges that Wilson presented were offset uh, by the benefits that Paris Singer brought to the story. Uh, Singer, as we see here, um, was, uh, became a good friend of Meisner's um, in New York, as, as I had said. Um, and Meisner said of Singer um, that, that he had be, would become the cause of my existence for the next 10 years. And he would. The cause of, of Singer's existence at that time was to helping World War I soldiers and people that had been hurt. And so he had already turned his two European mansions into convalescent hospitals for uh, American soldiers. For those of us who may have seen Downton Abbey and re remember the, the, the series very well, um, the, the house has turned into a convalescent hospital, which so many wealthy people did um, in an era where there wasn't really any structure of hospitals and transport. So he had turned his British uh, home into one. Um, and he also had a home outside of Paris in Saint-Cloud, which um, he had given to uh, Isadora Duncan, who was on again, off again, his girlfriend, his mistress. Um, and she had her dance studio in there, but uh, he asked her if he could have it back so that it could become a convalescent hospital, which it did. They, by the way, had a very interesting relationship, Isadora Duncan. And, um, and Singer. They had a child, by the way, uh, Patrick Singer, who tragically died when he was three uh, and uh, the car rolled uh, down and it was in Paris and, and rolled down an embankment into the Seine River and little Patrick was drowned. But Meisner and Singer were deeply, deeply attached to each other. Uh, they were both ailing um, at this time in their lives, even though they weren't old, but they were middle-aged, they were ailing. Um, and so they thought that they would come on down to Palm Beach uh, to recuperate um, and maybe just to die. Uh, they were at the end of the, their, there was no joy in their lives at that particular time. And they came down along with a nurse, Miss Bates, who will become the third Mrs. Singer eventually. And Singer owned a little um, bungalow on Peruvian Avenue, such as these. That's about the only thing that there was in Palm Beach other than the hotel and, and Whitehall when they got here. And Meisner said, joking, amusingly, as I looked around Peruvian Avenue, all I saw were other atrocities similar to the one that we were in. Um, and also um, that the neighborhood, like other similar neighborhoods, where the land had been raped of all of its natural beauty. And so perhaps because they were well taken care of by Miss Bates, um, and perhaps because they were in a, they had given up drinking or much of their drinking, um, and their health improved. And as their health improved, uh, they started to look around uh, Palm Beach to think of what they might be able to do in this very primitive place. Um, and uh, one day, remember, Singer's big thing in life was convalescent hospitals and World War I was still ongoing. And so Paris uh, takes Addison by the arm and he says, let me take you down about a mile from here on the lake, uh, meaning the, the intercoastal, um, and let me show you a piece of land that I'm thinking of buying and I want your opinion of it. And when Meisner saw it, he said, oh, it's so beautiful that it ought to be something religious with a chapel built into the lake with great cool cloisters and a court of oranges, a great gate over there on the road where the faithful could leave their offerings and receive largesse. What a spot. And what they were looking at, ladies and gentlemen, was this. They were looking at something called Joe's Alligator Farm. Um, it was about the only gig in town uh, where wealthy tourists uh, from the Royal Ponciana Hotel would be brought down the uh, trail uh, to watch Joe wrestle alligators. And that was, that was the big uh, excursion of the day, and then they'd go back to the hotel. And uh, Meisner uh, convinced uh, Singer that if he bought it, that they would build something that would be truly exceptional. 
but my but uh, Singer wanted a hospital. So the initial intent of this structure was to be a convalescent hospital. But the war ended precipitously, and they changed courses. And the building that they started, they turned into the very famous Everglades Club, which we see a rare picture of here under construction. Um, and this is the view uh, from the lake of it under construction. And Meisner was in heaven. He had carte blanche to do whatever he wanted. He was in heaven. And so in his biography, he said, nowhere could I get tiles, so I built kilns. Um, I had to build a tree moving machine. Uh, what fun it was uh, teaching men how to stucco and others how to cure pip in chickens. He did everything. And, and, and within a year, within a year, um, with very little equipment, they had created what you're looking at now, which is the famous Everglades Club. So um, Meisner had, they, they picked the February 19th uh, for the grand opening of the Everglades Club because it was the birthday of the wealthiest, uh, there were many wealthy people pouring in now, but the wealthiest sort of most sought after member of high society which was Stotesbury's, Eva and Ned Stotesbury's. And that was their, their, their his, his birthday, Ned Stotesbury's birthday. And they picked the opening of the 19th to have this big celebration. Uh, we see the Everglades Club the way it looked then and exactly the way the original building looks today. Uh, there's been no change, there've been additions, but no change to what you're looking at. And it was connected by one of Meisner's famous cloisters. Paris Singer uh, took his apartment in there, two floors, um, which we, we see here, um, leading up to an upstairs bedroom. And if you have $100,000 a month uh, laying around, you can rent it. Um, uh, but there's a wait list uh, for having Paris Singer's apartment. So at the party, uh, which we see here, it was outside on a terrace. Now, Meisner had promised Singer that on the 19th of February, there would be a terrace to have the party at. Um, and then it would be surrounded with orange trees laden with fruit. You know, he spoke in these very grand terms, as you've already seen how he describes his relationships with people. Well, about a week before the party was supposed to happen, there was no terrace. It had not been built yet. Um, and uh, the party was scheduled. It was billed as the event that Palm, put Palm Beach on the social map. And Meisner saw a barge being towed down the intercoastal on its way to Miami with all of the supplies that it was perfect. It was divine intervention. It was the perfect thing to have to build his, his, uh, 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 his pier and his terrace. And so he sent someone out to, uh, to meet the, uh, to intercept the Coast Guard, uh, intercept the um, uh, tugboat driver, and he, he bribed him uh, to break down and they confiscated all of the equipment. Um, and within a week, they had in fact built this terrace um, that you're looking at that extended out into the lake. But he had promised Singer that there was going to be orange trees all around it that were gonna be laden with fruit. So, and there were none. So he had bought orange trees that were in big vats. Um, he sent somebody off to buy oranges and with clothes pins, he tied all the oranges onto the trees around the terrace um, and with the beautiful lighting in the evening, as the evening came, no one was much the wiser, but everybody was absolutely enchanted. And after that, um, his mentor, Paris Singer, said that Addison is like the architects of the Middle Ages. He paints, carves wood, and works in metals, knows all about making glazed pottery, and his wrought iron is second to none in Old Spain. So Eva Stotesbury was there, of course, it was in honor of her husband. And she looks around and she is overwhelmed with how wonderful a, a, a home this could be. It was a club, but how wonderful a home. She had two really grand other homes. The main one um, is in Windmore outside of Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. Um, and it's White Marsh Hall. One of the greatest losses of American residential architecture was that this was destroyed. And um, the architect that she had selected, uh, who had done Winmore Hall, was working on some plans for her to have a home here in Palm Beach. 
Um, and she said, oh, Mr. Meisner, I would love to have a home that you designed, but we're already well into the plans um, with Horace Trumbauer. And he said, well, Mrs. Stotesbury, when did Mr. Trumbauer say he would deliver the home to you? And she said, in four years. And he said, well, if you like this so much, I will give you a home when you come back here for next season. And he gave her El Mirasol. Um, he built these homes in astonishing quick, at an astonishing quick pace because he knew all the trades and he wasn't an architect who sat in an office somewhere. He was out there with them, mobilizing people. You saw from the example of the tugboat how ingenious he was at doing things. And so when the Stosbury's came back, they had El Mirasol, uh, which we see here, and was expanded on several occasions. And you see the aerial view here. There's other areas all collect, co connected uh, with his beautiful cloisters, uh, like one of the cloisters that you see there on the left um, and the living room with one of his signature uh, items, which is beautifully carved vaulted ceilings. And that living room was just um, contained all of the elements he wanted in a living room, which also included windows on three sides. He was brilliant um, at creating ventilation. He was brilliant at making sure that the kitchens uh, were on the side of the house where the prevailing winds didn't come from, so that there were no smells and that there was air throughout the whole house. And they had the first indoor swimming pool in South Florida, um, which we see here. The Stotesbury's were, were very liberal socially. Um, they had a small zoo on their 40-acre property that, uh, El Salvador, that um, El Mirasol sat on. And they would invite the children, not just the celebrity children, the wealthy children. There really weren't that, that many children that came down with these families. But the local, the merchant's children and the local children, they would entertain them um, at El Mirasol, which was, you know, really very, very different um, and not something that was common in those days. But our Ava Stotesbury, who Meisner called Queen Ava, died in 1946. Um, and she had two very, very powerful children who wanted to try to save El Mirasol, which would have been today one of the most beautiful homes in America. Her children were powerful, as I said. Um, her son had married Doris Duke, um, certainly another enormous fortune. Um, their daughter had married General MacArthur. What do you think of that outfit, ladies? Um, and uh, so there was power there and they tried and tried to turn it into a hotel uh, and or a club. But at that time, the, with the makeup of the Palm Beach Town Council, nobody wanted to do it. And so in 1954, all of the treasures or many of the treasures were, were auctioned off from the living room that you saw a picture of when it was in its heyday. And the house was torn down. And the only thing that remains, if you drive up County Road, um, just as you're getting into the area that's called the canopy, which is a beautiful area with all the uh, trees creating a little canopy, you will see one of the gates to El Mirasol that has been cleverly incorporated into a house there. But that's all that is remaining of El Mirasol. And if there ever was a condition, uh, a, an argument for preservation, look at this. This is the site now where El Mirasol sat as a single home uh, with a tea house, of course, over on the, on the intercoastal and outbuildings, out but that was, that's the site where all of these homes exist now today. Just to the north, um, as you're looking at that screen, um, uh, to your right of, of, uh, of Val Mirasol, the, um, the Phippses, the famous Phipps family, the Americans, uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, best parts of American society, bought another 40 acres. Um, and Josh Phipps uh, married a woman by the name of Margarita Grace. Um, uh, and uh, the name Grace in those days was synonymous with shipping. Uh, that was a big American shipping company, the Grace Line. Um, and so when, when Margarita Grace came into the mix of Meisner and his friends, Mrs. Stotesbury and others, um, they would all go to Europe on buying sprees. Oh, did they have fun. Uh, they went to all of the big capitals of the Europe, uh, particularly around the Mediterranean, and they would buy anything in sight, a wall, uh, anything, huge fireplaces, parts of buildings. And Mrs. Gray, Mrs. Phipps, who was Miss Grace, had her freighters, had freighters waiting by them. Um, and they would load up these freighters and they would take the freighters back and there would be another round of freighters to meet them when they got to Italy. They, in the meantime, had come over on a great liner, shipped their Rolls Royces and other cars. It must have been an absolutely fabulous uh, summer, the way they spent their summer. 
And so his clients were really wed to him. It didn't matter if they came in and double the budget or triple the budget. The clients were so enamored to, with him um, that it was a great, great fun to work with him. So the Phipps's build Casa Bandita, blessed house. Uh, we, you see on the right there a beautiful colonnade around a pool um, and a cloister connecting the, up above, connecting the two sides of the house. And here was that colonnade around the pool and the upper, upper cloister. And Meisner um, also on his major clients uh, was able to convince them to also let him be interior de decorator um, on the ground floors. He said he didn't care what they did up in the bedrooms, but on the ground floors, they were gonna use those houses and live in those houses the way they were meant to be lived in. And so on these tours, these grand tours, they would buy all of these marvelous antiques. And I think that ceiling came over in pieces as did the moldings. And, and so this was what the living room, um, but also sadly and tragically, it was torn down. And that is what stands on the lot that held Casa Bendita. Just to the north of it, another 40 acre parcel was sold uh, to Josh and Eleanor and Nell Cousin. And they were new rich in Palm Beach. There was a bit sort of a social class because the Stotesbury's and the Phipps's were old money. Um, and these were new rich. They were looked down a little bit at first until they started realizing that in England, whether you had four generations of money or one generation of money, it was all new money. And they started inviting the British royal family who would come to the house that you're going to see ultimately. And of course that elevated uh, the Cosdens in, in everybody's stature. It is believed um, that F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, tailored uh, the Great Gatsby story <coughs> after Josh Cousin. Um, he had uh, been a small, uh, he had run a farm, a, a drugstore, uh, in, um, in, in, and before he created the Mid Continent Oil Refinery in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which became a very important company. And he rose from rags to wit riches, and they built Playa Riente, Laughing Beach. Um, which was uh, on another 40 acres, and it was Meisner's favorite. All three of these homes are Meisner's, of course, by the way. And in Meisner's memoir, he didn't ever want Queen Eva to know this, but this was his favorite house. Um, its interiors were absolutely amazing. The dining room was covered um, in leather, hand-painted leather that they had bought on one of their tours out of a home, uh, out of a castle in Spain. Um, and look at the grand entranceway that this house had um, with two fabulous staircases into it. And check out that coffered ceiling, all with grand relief carving, which was so rare at, at the day. Um, and so uh, then, unfortunately, they went from rags to riches. Uh, they will go back to rags um, and they lose all of their money. And the house is bought by Anna Dodge, who was an enormously wealthy American heiress and the widow of the man who started the Dodge Automobile Company. And she would live there very, very happily, maintaining it beautifully until she died at 100 years old. Um, but um, this is what happened to the wonderful site upon which Playa Riente lived, uh, stood. And the only thing that's remaining, um, the house is gone, but the only thing that's remaining is this incredible seawall that has been battered there by nearly, for nearly a hundred years. It's only part of all the seawalls that Meisner built are still there. Um, and there's a door, as you can see, and there's a wonderful tunnel that goes uh, under the ground and used to come up um, in dressing rooms and massage rooms um, it, within Playa Oriente. So all good architects dream of having their own home. And Meisner was no exception. And so he built several homes for himself that he never really lived in because he was always in need of money. You'd think that with these clients, um, with the way they handled him and revered him and really the, would give bills to their husband and say, we have to pay for this bill, this house. Um, and so you would think he had a lot of money, but he didn't. Wilson was always spending more and wasting more than Meisner had. But the first house he builds for himself is El Solano, which is the name of a, a wind in California. And it's um, just, just south of, uh, the, at the, in the beginning of the estate section that I showed you. Um, but he needed money. So very shortly after he moved in, 
um, he sells the house um, to his friend, Harold Vanderbilt. Harold Vanderbilt will remain a very close friend and ally of Meisner's as Meisner falls into a bad state at the end of his life. Um, and when Vanderbilt sold the house, he sold it to the McLean family. Uh, look at this grand Evelyn Walsh McLean, who was the last person to own and wear the Hope Diamond. Um, which is in the Smithsonian, was said to have belonged to Louis XIV of France. And from the, that family, we have the, the most famous of all the owners, which was John Lennon, um, who cr helped create Palm Beach's Landmarks Commission. In 1979, the only year he lived there because he was killed um, uh, after that first winter. And we see here mourners um, in front of the house um, when, they, when the news came of his death. The second house that Meisner built for himself uh, was Concha Marina. It was built for George Sloan on, at the, on Jungle Road and the Ocean. Gorgeous home that had fallen into a state of disrepair, believe it or not, when this woman owned it. Um, Ivana Trump was in that house for a long time, but they didn't maintain it very well. Um, it has subsequently been bought by owners who, who care for it and who have loved it um, and have brought it back to its health. And the third house he built for himself, uh, Sin Ciudado, which meant beyond the city. Uh, um, and that's because um, he hoped that if he built something a little further south, that maybe he could keep it and his celebrity friends wouldn't want to buy it. Um, but he got into financial trouble again, um, and he sold Sin Ciudado to Edward Moore, who also um, will become uh, a very su a big supporter of Meisner at the end of his life. Sadly, that house has also been torn down uh, because it had been landmarked and then it was unlandmarked because if you alter too much, too much alteration takes place in the house, it can be de-landmarked. They de-landmarked it with nothing we could do to stop it and they tore the magnificent home down. Finally, Meisner builds the house that he can enjoy that is suitably grand for him to entertain his very special clients, but that he believes none of them will want because it's in town. Uh, it's neither on the lake uh, with a beautiful view nor on the ocean with the beach in front of it. Um, it is in the middle of the town that he is beginning to create, which is all around Worth Avenue. Um, it is this, this structure that we've outlined for you. It's a, a, a tower um, that, that sits upon a, a large base. And Meisner was trying to create uh, what he had found in inner cities. Uh, uh, I don't mean inner cities in that way, but he had found in the uh, cities in Rome and in Paris, where you had all of these beautiful pedestrian streets around beautiful homes that you really couldn't see or imagine what they were. They were meant to be sort of cachet. And so that's what, that's what this house is. The top floor um, is called the Mirador. Um, it was the one room floor um, where he could watch all of his island. It was then the highest part of the island. He could watch all of his island with all of the magnificent constructions that he had going around. He loved working up there. Um, and uh, the uh, huge ballroom, which I've just put an arrow to, on, on your screen, uh, the huge ballroom extends way down Worth, way, Worth Avenue, and I'm going to show you pictures of it. And so here is Worth Avenue that he and Singer were building, um, and, and an illustration of it in 1924. Um, that is the Villa Meisner there, where I put the arrow. And the story fascinated me so much that I wanted to write a story initially, not so much about Addison Meisner, but about this house um, and all of its owners. And so uh, the first owner, of course, of Villa Meisner is Addison Meisner, who lived there from its completion in 1924 until his death in 1933. After which, um, it was bought by Mortimer and Rose Sachs, who bought up a tremendous amount of real estate. And as you can see, there was a big gap between the time that Meisner died in 1933 and the time that the Sachses bought it because it was the Depression. And Palm Beach did not escape the Depression. Um, Villa Meisner had been turned into sort of a rooming house uh, with uh, broken windows and no screens. It was a mess when the Saxes bought Via Meisner, the whole Via that's around it because Meisner owned that, bought that and Villa Meisner and lived there <clears throat> for all of those years that you can see. This is a picture that I took of Rose Sachs at her 100th birthday. Um, uh, uh, and then she passed away three years later. 
but they loved that house. Uh, but sadly, uh, when they bought it, there were a lot of Meisner treasures in it. But I can understand this. Mrs. Sachs was a young bride at the time, and she said, I didn't want to live with Meisner. So they got rid of all of his furniture. And as you can see from the furniture that they put in it, um, it was really more of a, a 50s look. And then um, after Mortimer Sachs died, uh, Mrs. Sachs sold it to the Knuths, Robert and Gay Knuth. She was a beauty, um, uh, Norwegian uh, uh, Miss Norway. Uh, he owned a home in Norway. That's where he had met her. He was there often. But again, they wanted it to look their way. And so we see inside of Villa Meisner an, an 80s look. And, you know, uh, none of the other members had been, uh, other owners had been members of the Everglades Club, which is right across the street from Villa Meisner. The Everglades Club um, is the most um, exclusive uh, club th uh, around. I use that not in a flattering word, but I mean exclusive in terms of keeping everybody out. Um, and the Saxes were Jewish. Um, and I think Meisner wanted to bring his pets. And there were always reasons why uh, nobody could live. They couldn't become members of the Everglades Club. But uh, it looked like Knuth was going to be it. He was going to be acceptable, socially prominent, and everything was going to be fine until one day he came back from Norway to find Mrs. Knuth in bed with one of the iron workers, and he threw all of her clothes out of the window while the executive committee of the Everglades Club across the street was reviewing their credentials. So uh, you can imagine what happened with that application. And as I said, I found the story so fascinating and that the people who have lived in Villa Meisner have so changed it. Um, that I wrote a book about it. Um, and the book was inaugurated by the new owners of Villa Meisner, new then in, in 2012, Dee and Nick Adams, who have bought this house and turned it, first of all, into a smart house, obviously had all of the windows custom made to be uh, hurricane resistant. Um, and they uh, went to a great amount of trouble to recreate a house that looks very much like it was. They like to say that uh, it was just like Meisner stepped out to dinner. This is Meisner's great room, his living room, his room, the way he had it in 1924. And this is the great room now with some modern art and some personal items. Uh, now that the Adams have restored it, all of the ironwork has been copied. All of the glasswork has been copied. The broken floors have been repaired. And we can see these two rooms um, the way they stand side by side today. Uh, Meisner had a wonderful dining room, this, which was, this is the dining room that Meisner had in his day. It is lined by wood carvings that came from Spain. Uh, they were in King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella's castle in Salamanca in Spain. Um, and they're beautiful carvings of all of the famous uh, and religious figures of the day in Spain. They were brought over. Meisner uh, claims they were a gift, <clears throat> but in fact, no, the, there's no record that uh, King Alfonso XIII gave them to him, who he says he did, but they are authentic. Um, and we can see ha here the way um, the, uh, the uh, Adams family has done a dining room with furniture that could have been his, it, it wasn't. Um, and we see those two rooms, the rooms side by side today. So um, the, I'm going to just check my time because we are running way over time. I, even though I can't see you, I am so wonderfully happy to be with you that I've been gabbing on. And I'm very happy to continue. But am I correct that at 5 o'clock we, um, we get shut off? Uh, uh, we, have, we have a 5 o'clock hard stop. So. Um... Well, here's what I suggest. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll stop. I'll keep going until we're cut off. I would then you reschedule for the second half. I would, I, <laughs> I, would, I would love to do it because um, right. I'd, I'd, I'd rather not cut the uh, story right to the end because there's still a lot to do. So um, the uh, somebody once said that uh, that charm is the ability to cast a spell, and that's what these vias do. If if you come to Palm Beach, when you come to Palm Beach, please walk through the vias. There's a nine of them, and they co they connect. Um, Worth Avenue with Peruvian Avenue. 
uh, to the north. And you can wander through them. There are some also that just extend to the southern side of Worth Avenue, even though um, that they, there's nothing that connects to, but they're charming. And this is Via Parigi, for example, one of my favorite, but they're all equally charming. And I'll walk you just a little bit through it. Um, Via Parigi connects to, um, to Via Meisner, and he named it, of course, after his mentor, Paris Singer. And there are all these charming little stores around it. There are apartments over each of them. They never come on the market. They're always word to mouth. And Villa Meisner is part of this. Uh, we'll come on and I'll show you how it fits into all of this. Um, and they're beautiful stores. And I urge you to come. There's restaurants. Not all of them are expensive. There's some wonderful cafes that you can eat there. So you would have thought that given his huge success and his comfortable nature living in Villa Meisner, as well as the fact that he bought the building immediately to the east um, in which he housed um, his, he was making pottery. The ground floor was a pottery display. He was making furniture too. And he had those displays on the next floor up, Singer and he had very grand offices. And then you had the draftsman and even some bunk rooms on the top floor. And at this point, you would have thought he would have been happy, but no, he wanted to create a whole city. He wanted to create the model city of Boca Raton. And so he created the Meisner Development Corporation in Boca Raton. Um, and uh, they bought up a whole piece of land, which was unincorporated at the time. Um, this was the original plat of an area called Boca Ratone. Um, and the reason they selected Boca Ratone um, was that uh, topography was very similar to Palm Beach. The area that is Boca Raton shown uh, by the grid of the streets that were being laid out um, would be West Palm Beach, um, and then the intercoastal, the equivalent, and then where A1A is in Boca Raton would be the equivalent of Palm Beach. And the other similarity was that the intercoastal opens into a lake right there in Boca Raton, Lake Boca Ratone, um, and now Lake Boca Raton, as well as Lake Worth here in Palm Beach. And also another similarity, they had uh, each had a uh, inlet. And the idea was to create a model city um, in the Venetian style. Uh, Meisner was, you know, very grand at this point in time in his life, and he was egged on by Wilson. Wilson, Meisner was not a brag, but Wilson, when he was around Wilson, and Wilson made him into a brag. And they designed something that was going to be called, called Meisner Castle. It was going to be connected to what the, is now the Boca Raton Resort uh, by a, a drawbridge that you can see there, a moat and a drawbridge on the, on the right side of your screen. It was never built, and the main section of it um, was a copy of Villa Meisner. But what was built, one of the first things that was built, was the hotel called the Cloister Inn, which then became the Boca Raton Hotel, the Boca Raton Resort and Hotel, the Boca Raton Club. Um, and so uh, that central part, this is, this is the Cloister Inn in 1926 when it opened. Um, and, and it's called the Cloister Hotel because it's the, the old part is connected with beautiful cloisters. Go and walk around in there. And now that you've seen some of these things, you may appreciate some of the details a little bit better. No, note the proportions of the columns um, in, in these cloisters. Meisner was a master at testing proportions. And no other architect would have given them these proportions. They would have done something much more classical. But he had, he had an eye, and he knew how he could create a spell and bring it together. Uh, at the opening in 1926 of the Cloister Inn, we see him flanked here by famous Holloway, Ho Ho um, Hollywood people. And they all went to have dinner in the magnificent Cloister Inn dining room, which years later um, became the uh, cathedral dining room. I remember as a young man being enchanted dining in this room. Um, and as we see it here right now, you know, the, this hotel is owned by a huge company. It has never, uh, is always successively, successfully been bought by bigger and bigger company, co companies. And they've turned it into a huge mass site. Um, and they have not done anything sadly. Uh, to preserve some of these elements. For example, these columns that were all gold leaf and the ceiling that was all gold leaf, it's all been painted over, which is really sad. But if you go, when you go, you'll see that the central part of the hotel, you know, is definitely Meisner, as you can see here, and seen from across the lake, um, you see the central part of the hotel and then all of the main big apartments and, and beautiful, 
fabulous ones. And then the big scandal when that tower was built in the mid 1960s over what was the swimming pool of the original hotel. The Cloister Inn or the Boca Town Hotel was not supposed to be the main hotel. It was supposed to be the small overspill hotel. They had grand, this was going to be big. Their plans were very broad and very large. And they were going to build on A1A um, a Ritz-Carlton Hotel. They had Cesar Ritz on board. They had the whole plan was, was made, but it didn't happen. And the reason that it and so many other things that had been planned didn't happen was that in 1926, there was the real estate bust. We had had the biggest bubble of all times in the early 20s in Florida, in South Florida, and that bubble burst in 1926. And a successive of horrible stories happened that same year. Um, there was the Miami hurricane, which killed 475 people, destroyed a lot of homes all the way through Palm Beach County. Uh, by the way, Palm Beach County included what is now Broward and Dade. Um, when Flagler staked it out, it was all Palm Beach County. And um, the, but in Meisner's homes up here, might have lost a tile or two off of their roofs. They were so well built. And then that was followed by the, the banking boom, which also burst in 1927. Uh, I love this cartoon because even if you had saved some money uh, at that point in time, um, it, it wouldn't have done you any good. And finally, um, the 1928 Okeechobee hurricane, which destroyed Palm Beach County. Again, not Meisner's homes, but 4,078 people dead. And then the Great Depression, which starts in 1929. So um, Meisner had put together an incredibly powerful board of directors to guide him in his Meisner Development Corporation that was owned and was going to build Boca Raton. Those board members included Senator DuPont, um, Harold Vanderbilt, his old pal that he had sold El Solano to, um, his brother William Kesham Vanderbilt, the great real estate developer from Philadelphia, Clarence Geist, who had been so successful there and was going to chair the board. And then he rounded it off um, with celebrities, notably Irving Berlin, um, the Duchess of Sutherland, and Elizabeth Arden. So he had put together this amazing board of directors that could have seen him through all of those tragedies and of the depression if it hadn't been for Wilson. Wilson had gotten all of these grand ideas. Um, the promotional material was beginning to be embarrassing to that board of directors during the Great Depression, uh, ads such as this. Um, and Meisner said that it was a cosmopolitan world community destined to be the world's most architecturally beautiful playground, which it could have become uh, if it weren't for the fact that um, the board members asked Meisner to fire Wilson. Uh, Wilson was bragging about all of the million dollars and things, and this was not going over well in the at the beginning of the Depression. They told him to fire Wilson. He wouldn't do it, so they fired both of them. So Meisner was driven out of town. Um, and uh, the sad day when the Meisner Development Company was bought up by its board, but uh, on a sale on the steps of the of the uh, Palm Beach County Courthouse on April 30, uh, Meisner said that wasn't the sad thing that happened to him that day. His spider monkey, Johnny Brown, died. And Meisner was such an unusual person that I actually believe um, that he felt that Johnny Brown's death was equal, if not greater, um, than the tragedy he, he had suffered. Johnny Brown uh, is uh, buried here in Via Meisner, there are a couple of restaurants, including a very, very charming one called Pizza Al Fresco. It's an upscale pizza place. You can sit outside in that gorgeous courtyard. And if, if you look over to the side where Villa Meisner is, you'll see a tombstone, um, which says Johnny Brown, the human monkey. It happens to be the only approved cemetery in Palm Beach. Um, and it has uh, uh, Meisner's spider monkey and Mrs. Sachs's collie uh, laddie. We all know uh, what happened to Boca Raton. Uh, it succeeded very well. Um, it just didn't succeed with more of a historic center, but everything that wherever you go, um, there's Meisner this, there's Addison that, over and over and over again. And I think if Meisner is looking down on this, he's smiling. Uh, along Federal Highway, right at Meisner Boulevard, there's that huge statue of Meisner standing up there. And if you look closely, he's got a monkey on his, on his shoulder and a parrot in his hand. And I'd like to think that he is smiling down on this. He didn't have any work after, after he was driven out of um, Boca. It 
was sort of, he was sort of a broken man. Um, his clients had vanished. Um, he, he, was a, he didn't have much work. He retreated to Villa Meisner, but Harold Wilson pulled, to, uh, uh, Vanderbilt, I'm sorry, pulled together enough money um, to buy a center part of Palm Beach and they built the beautiful Meisner uh, uh, Fountain in Meisner Square. It's been renovated now and this is what it looks like now. Again, if you come to Palm Beach, I urge you after you've walked through the vias, walk over and see the fountain and now that it's been beautifully restored and at night it's very grand. In the background there, um, you see Town Hall. So Meisner's story starts to come to an end uh, when he is about to turn 60 years old and he decides he wants to go and see Wilson um, in California. Uh, he wants to be with his brother. Before Meisner went bankrupt, he had bought Wilson uh, some real estate and a business in, in Los Angeles and his car had been repossessed. Um, and in a car very similar to this and with his two of his favorite dogs, he drives across the country um, and he has started to have cardiac problems. His leg is sore again, it's infected, and he drives all the way to Los Angeles where he goes to the Ambassador Hotel where he has lodged Wilson in a permanent suite, and he collapses um, in the lobby of the hotel. Um, he's taken to the hospital and he recuperates from that, from that attack. And then he stayed for a while in uh, California, um, and they used to eat every night at the Brown Derby because Meisner had bought Wilson a share. Uh, in the Brown Derby and they would eat there. They had created a uh, one-way mirror uh, so that they could, the, the glass was mirrored on the outside and they would sit in that window and they would look out. Nobody could see in uh, because there were bill collectors looking for them. And if a bill collector would come, they'd either hide in the bathroom or they'd just say, oh, can just put the bill down there, put it on the top of the pile or the bottom of the pile, whatever you want. And no one's ever going to be able to get around to it. So Meisner asked Wilson if he would join him and they'd go to Texas to take the baths and drink the water and be cured. And uh, Wilson didn't go, Meisner did go. He falls sick again on arrival uh, at, at mineral wells, at mineral, to take mineral springs. And somehow he gets back to, back to his beautiful, his, uh, his place where he's happy and he's sedated and pleased and he's back at Villa Meisner, a very, very sick man. And in his memoir, um, the way he writes his memoir, there are no regrets. There are no regrets that he's penniless, that he's intestate, um, that he had been such a grandly public and famous figure, and he wasn't. He was alone in, in Villa Meisner. His staff had gone. He was left with one, one uh, housekeeper um, and with a part-time secretary who, um, um, Vanderbilt would come to every week with uh, envelopes full of money and say, just, you know, pay off the bills you can, keep him very comfortable, keep him happy. Um, and the housekeeper was wonderful. And he said to her on the day he died, please bring me upstairs to the mirror door and prop me up on my bed. And I want to look at the sunset and with Johnny Brown on one side of him and his favorite uh, pug on the other side at sunset, um, he slipped away um, in this room. On, on February 5 of 1933 at sunset. So um, he had asked that there not be any service. Uh, however, Ava Stotesbury took over. Uh, she commandeered the house, she, the living room here. Um, she, she invited a thousand people flowed through that house. She put a string quartet in the foyer, which they had enjoyed every night when they would come to Meisner to plan to see the plans of the day of their mansions. There would be a string quartet here. And it was playing. And as Stotesbury came in, she looked down that corridor into the living room. She saw that all of her flowers and everything were fine. And she left, uh, claiming that she had seen the vision of Johnny Brown, uh, who most people will tell you is still in that house. He's a happy ghost. He's not a mean ghost. He's a happy ghost. And Meisner um, is buried in California, in San Mateo, California, in Cypress Lawn Cemetery, in one of the urns that the Meisner development, that the Meisner manufacturing company made. And you see here that there aren't, there isn't one urn, there's two urns, because when Wilson was told about this, um, he died precipitously. And so they're buried next to each other um, in these urns. And that's the story of our wonderful Addison Cairns Meisner, without whom 
we wouldn't have Palm Beach. We wouldn't have all of these beautiful stories and all of these beautiful mansions. Um, and this is a wonderful rendering of Worth Avenue and the end, the east end of Worth Avenue after its recent renovation with the tower and the clock. And with that, I want to thank you very, very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been so wonderful being able to visit with you. And I'm sorry if I went over, only 10 minutes over. You'll, you, you'll forgive me, won't you? You're won't fine. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee. That was fabulous. We are just fascinated by everything that you had to say, and we look forward to hearing from you again sometime. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise. And thank all of you for joining us. It was great to have so many people on this, this Zoom call today. And I hope you will all also join us on Tuesday, July 7th at 7 p.m. It's easy to remember. 7-7 seven, seven at 7 for our sixth annual Jewish Unity Day with world-class entertainment, Jewish community leaders, tears, laughter, surprises, and as always, a grand finale this year. It's going to be in the um, genre of Tonight Show meets Saturday Night Live. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Look for your email with additional meaningful ways to connect with our Federation and our Jewish community during these unprecedented times, including how you can make a real difference for those in need by contributing to our annual campaign. Together, we are caring for our community and we thrive. Stay safe and be well. And thanks again for joining us. Goodbye. <laughs>